Welcome to Gideon's Promise, the podcast with Jonathan Rapping. In the landmark 1963 decision, Gideon v. Wainwright, the U.S. Supreme Court unanimously ruled every person accused of a crime in America must be provided a lawyer, regardless of their ability to pay. This podcast is about the people that uphold that promise, public defenders. These dedicated lawyers give voice to 80% of the people thrown into the system. And yet, in the national discussion regarding justice reform, public defenders are largely overlooked. This show centers public defenders in that conversation. We will explore the critical role public defenders play in addressing a wide range of issues facing marginalized communities with subject matter experts, key opinion leaders, and people impacted by the American criminal legal system. Listen as a community of advocates discuss their work to strengthen public defenders and transform public defense. Today's podcast, we have a little bit of a a, a twist. Usually, um, for the first couple of podcasts, I've been the host, Uh, but I'm really excited to let everyone know that later this month, on August 18th, my new book, Gideon's Promise, A Public Defender Movement to Transform Criminal Justice, is going to drop. And today, we're going to actually be having an interview about the book. And so the tables are turned and Illy is going to take over as the interviewer and she's going to talk to me about the book today. So let me turn it over to Illy. Well, thank you. Thank you, Rap, for having me uh, (laughs) be the host interviewer. And just so everyone knows, if you're a first time listener to our podcast, I am Ilham Askia. Everyone refers to me as Illy. I'm the executive director of Gideon's Promise. And they should also know I didn't let you be the host. You call all the shots when it comes to Gideon's Promise. I I did. I did. This was my idea, even though you take many of my ideas. But this I I did do this. I decided to be the interview. And I think who best to interview about this very important book coming out, but your wife. So not only am I the executive director, many people know I'm also John Rapping's wife. And so this will be a great, I think, great interview today. It'll be fun. So I just want to acknowledge to our listening audience, by the time of the airing of this show, um, a few weeks will have passed since the passing of Congressman John Lewis. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about rap what Congressman Lewis meant to Gideon's Promise, the organization, to us personally as a family, and and even more importantly, the public defenders that we support every day. And so um, just tell me a little bit about how this his passing has af- affected you. Well, look, I, I mean, I think Congressman Lewis's passing has affected everybody who cares about justice and who understands the fight that Congressman Lewis was engaged in, I think personally, and for Gideon's promise, um, uh, his death is impactful because he was such an inspiration to our lawyers. When we first moved to the South, um, I think for me, it was eye-opening to see that while I understood public defenders were really engaged in a critical fight for civil rights all across the country, Um, I learned when I moved to the South that in many parts of the country, there is not a a client-centered culture, a strong community that respects public defense. And so many public defenders um, in places like Georgia and Mississippi and Alabama were sort of fighting this fight in isolation without a lot of support. Um, And we... uh, asked Congressman Lewis if he would um, speak to our community uh, because he was such a model of someone who resisted a culture of injustice. Um, And he agreed and he spoke to our community and he was a dear friend of Gideon's Promise ever since. And so um, losing Congressman Lewis, uh, it it, it certainly hurts the organization, but I also think his, his memory will continue to inspire us for a long time. I agree with you. I think the one thing about Congressman Lewis is as many social media posts were happening right on the, you know, the the uh, directly after his passing, just how much of a people person he was. Mm. Right. You would run into him. You know, the children and I would run into him in our neighborhood all of the time. I mean, he was grocery shopping, Mm -hmm. you know, just like anybody else. Right. But he was this icon, this symbol of freedom um, in our country and more importantly to many Georgians here in Atlanta. And so 
I think having the opportunity for our children who hear about this figure in books and television, but to actually in encounter with them, have encounters with him, was just, I think, one of the best moments of my life to give that gift to our kids. No, I certainly. And I, I think as I, I talked to friends all across Atlanta, it wasn't uncommon for people in Atlanta to have had personal experiences with Congressman Lewis like the experience you're describing. Mm -hmm. Many people have pictures with Congressman Lewis, stories of conversations with him in the community. He really was the kind of person who um, came out uh, and, and interacted with the community he served. Um, and he certainly treated public defenders that way. He would always say to us when he'd see us, mm -hmm. thank the public defenders for me. I love public defenders. You all are doing God's work. Yeah, he would. And um, i just like to thank con the congressman's family for giving us that gift and sharing him with us and the rest of the world. Absolutely. So let's let's turn our direction over to why I'm interviewing you today, <laughs> Rap, right? Um, you have a book, like you mentioned in your intro, Gideon's Promise, a Public Defender Movement to Transform Criminal Justice. Its release date is August 18th. There's a pre-order, pre-sale campaign going on to benefit Gideon's Promise, the organization, to bring more public defenders into the community, right? Yes. Um, so pre-order, please pre-order. Why did you write this book? So I, I wrote the book because um, we had been doing this work in the South since 2005, um, actually formed Gideon's Promise as an organization in 2007, had always seen public defenders as really central to this ongoing struggle for criminal justice and for civil rights. And several years ago, I think, as the nation really started to um, recognize the need to address problems in our criminal legal system, um, there started to be a lot of national conversations about how we can address these injustices. Um, and time and time again, uh, there would be conversations that promoted reforms, promoted policies, promoted the work of various actors. Public defenders were continually ignored. And I think we tried through our outreach, through our social media, through articles to center public defenders in the conversation. Um, but, but, but I think we were always frustrated that we weren't able to make more progress. So I, I really thought it was important to write a book to tell the story of these heroic public defenders, um, but not just as lawyers who represent individual people in individual cases, but collectively as a movement that is really um, at the center of an effort to finally realize transformative justice in America. So who, the book was for whom? You were, you were writing it with what audience in mind? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I think there were, there were really uh, more than one audience. Certainly um, one audience were people who were um, involved in criminal justice reform, reformers. It, was, uh, it, it, it is hopefully a piece that will get them to um, start to more consciously include public defenders in their broader prescriptions for justice reform. Um, I also wanted to write it to be accessible to a more um, public audience, people who are really just starting to think about racial justice, economic justice, civil and human rights, so that they can really appreciate um, the role that public defenders play to sort of confront some of the negative stereotypes about public defenders that have existed for the decades since Gideon versus Wainwright was decided. And lastly, I wrote it for the public defenders. I wanted there to be a book that public defenders could pick up and read that didn't just say you all are noble um, because of the work you do in cases, but that you're critical to building a future that you and I and all the parents we know want for our children. So I know this book took you years, right? This is your life's work. The last 15 plus years running Gideon's Promise or working Gideon's Promise. Are you glad that it's about to be released? And what does your family think about the release of this book? <laughs> so so I, I will say I am so glad it's about to be released. Um, it is quite a relief because it certainly did consume me for the last 
two and a half years as far as what my family thinks about the book? I mean, really, Illy, I should be asking you that question. <laughs> what, what does my family think about this book? Well, I can't speak on behalf of the children, but as the wife, I am actually glad it's done. We've spent, I think, people who are family members of authors could appreciate what I am about to say, um, you know, trying to, for, to have quiet in the house, give you an opportunity to have you know, space to think and to write. I know you were up at two in the morning. You were trying to get a lot of this stuff written before taking our kids to school or to lacrosse practice or to track practice. But we are actually just as pleased as you are that this is hitting the bookshelves on August 18th. But also, more importantly, our kids grew up around public defenders. This is what they know. And to actually see their story being told in this book, to see the public defender stories being told in this book, I think I think I can speak on behalf of the kids and say we are very happy that this is coming out to really show. And you did an excellent job. I fortunately got to help with some small editing of it. but um, And I know I'm biased, but I think it's a pretty damn good book. Well, uh, <laughs> you, you were involved more than you give yourself credit for. There would be no book if it weren't for you. I think of this as our book. And when I say our, I mean yours and mine and Lucas and Aaliyah's as well. Um, I do want to take a minute to very publicly apologize to you and the children because <laughs> uh, writing this book was time consuming. Uh, I was writing it during a time, as you know, that was critical to the development of Gideon's Promise. Yes. I'm um, spending a lot of time uh, trying to take Gideon's Promise to the next phase. I'm a full-time teacher at Atlanta's John Marshall Law School. That didn't stop. And so I am sure that there were times when I was short and I was frustrated. And if I ever snapped at you or the children, let me publicly apologize and say <laughs> there'd be no book if it weren't for you. Well, you could make it up to us uh, uh, by once COVID is over, taking us on a really nice vacation. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> Done. We talked about family and I wanted to start to transition into talking about some of the, the overarching themes of this book, right? You talk, you know, it's broken into sections based on these themes that basically you use to help create the foundation for Gideon's Promise, mm -hmm. the organization. Um, it talks about values, culture, and transformation. And I just wanted to ask you, why were why those themes? Why, why do those stand out to you? And I know you use them for Gideon's Promise, but they're also the main themes in your book. Yeah, so so working backwards, I mean, the, the, the three sections of the book are values, culture, and transformation. Working backwards, um, the book really is about a vision to transform criminal justice. Um, I think moving back one section, I think we recognize that transformational change is going to require a change in culture, that policy fixes alone aren't enough, that there is a culture that drives injustice that we must confront. And then moving back to the first section of the book, um, I, I think what we believe at Gideon's Promise is that culture change is values driven, that it really all boils down to the values that we embrace. And I do want to say, as I'm talking about values, you asked who the book was written for. I, I, I'd be remiss in not mentioning my mother mm -hmm. who, um, who passed just a couple days after my 50th birthday. And for a decade, she was my editor. She helped me write every article I wrote as a law professor. Um, it was always her idea that, that, that we should write a book and that the articles would be the basis of the book. Um, and really, as you read the book, you'll see that the values that drove me to do this work, the values that ultimately shaped the work of Gideon's Promise, come from both my parents. Um, my father died when I was 26. So in the second half of my life really were reinforced by my mother. So I, I do want to give my mother a shout out. And I think, I think knowing Elaine as, as well as I do, I think she would be very proud. And I know when Beacon Press made you the offer to write this book, she had just passed away um, a, f a few days before that. And so I know she would be very, very proud mm -hmm proud of you and the work that you've done mm -hmm. and those values that she bestowed upon you and your sister, Allison. Um, I think she, all I can say, just knowing her personally, you know, she, she, she would really, really be proud of you, Rap. She'd be proud of me. She'd be proud of my sister, Allison, and she always 
called you her daughter, so <laughs> she was incredibly proud of you as well. Yes, her chocolate daughter. Her chocolate, her chocolate daughter. daughter. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's talk about value. So Takuma Alom is, is a Jewish concept. It, it, it's a value. Can you explain that to the audience? Because I think um, what I've noticed, it, it's speaking at synagogues across the country and, and some of the work and the, the foundation of how you grew up. Can you mm-hmm. speak to that and what that, that mean, what that term means? Yeah, so I was born and raised in a Jewish community in Squirrel Hill. Uh, I'm sorry, a Jewish community in Pittsburgh called Squirrel Hill. Um, the Tree of Life Synagogue, Mm-hmm. where 11 um, Jewish worshipers were, were killed just a few years ago was my synagogue. I was bar mitzvah there. And, and as, a, as a Jew, I was raised to understand this concept of tikkun olam, which, which really means to repair the world. The idea is that as Jews, we have a duty to try to leave the world a better place than we found it. And that comes from a history uh, that... Uh, of oppression that Jews have experienced. And, and I think that the best of Judaism in America uh, sees Jews um, uh, as allies with communities that have been oppressed here in this country. Jews were disproportionately represented among white allies during the civil rights movement. Um, I, I, my work as a public defender, I think, has always been connected to this idea that I learned from from Judaism that 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 there is a duty to repair the world and ultimately I think building Gideon's promises is part of that vision that we must partner with all oppressed people to try to ensure that our children know a better world than than, than we knew. So you yourself have not experienced from the client side or the family side of people who have been incarcerated, right? You were a public defender. That's what brought you into this reform work. Um, so how is this work personal to you? Yeah, so so I think the work is is personal in the sense that I grew up in an activist household and my mother always raised me. My father always reinforced the idea that it is really important to... Um, to always fight against oppression. So I became a public defender um, in a system uh, where public defense was valued. I was the beneficiary of, uh, of, of, of being a lawyer at the DC Public Defender Service, where for 50 years, really noble public defenders who came before me built an organization that was fiercely client-centered, that was incredibly um, uh, supportive of public defenders that transformed the culture of the criminal justice system in Washington, D.C. And so when I moved to the South, I think it was very personal in the sense that I felt an obligation to try to bring so much of what I benefited from Mm -hmm. to communities of public defenders that didn't have that benefit. I recognize that while while I have been very privileged in my life, um, I have an obligation to, to give back. Um, but, but it's also personal because, as you know, I have uh, two black children. Um, and while in many ways we have been fortunate to raise them with, w- with the benefit of good schools and living in communities that are relatively safe, they'll walk through this world as, uh, as a black man and a black woman. And you know as well as anyone mm-hmm. what that means. And so I'd actually really ask you, so I'm going to switch roles and ask you, is it personal to you? Because I think so much of the way I see this work comes from what I've learned through my relationship with you. So first of all, you you have a, a control issue. I, this is my interview, right? <laughs> this is my interview. But I am going to answer that question. And I do think, I think one of the things before I understood that concept of Takuma Alon, which I learned from being married to you for the last 17 years, um, I think service is important. And, you know, my, I, I walk with the, um, quote by Shirley Chisholm, right? Uh, Service is the rent you pay for time here on this earth. Mm. And looking at the communities that I grew up in, in in, in upstate New York, looking at the processing of black men and women that grew up in my neighborhood, right? Mm. Um, Almost every man in my family has had an encounter with the criminal justice system, whether it was jail or prison or arrest. And so it's personal to me when you took on this... um, 
very arduous task, right, responsibility of helping to reform the system, I signed on because I saw there was a need. Um, there was a gap. There was this narrative created created about people that look like me from communities where I came from. And when I recognized that the last line of defense was a public defender who would be assigned to people all across this country, individual people in courtrooms all across the country, why not help build an organization to address the, the need to provide them with zealous advocacy? And so it is extremely personal, you know, primarily because I don't want to see any more children have to visit their parents behind Mm. bars simply because they didn't have great representation and a public defender that cared about them, cared about their families, and was also a zealous advocate. You you know, really, one thing that I, I, I learned from you, I take from you, that I carry with me as I do this work, I mean, obviously, um, your experience is, is personal, as you mentioned, so many men in your family have been, uh, have been um, impacted by the criminal justice system. Your father was incarcerated when you were five years old. And mm-hmm. and I know when you would always talk about what it did to you as a five-year-old girl, seeing your father processed into a prison cell in Attica for 10 years, one thing you always say that just sticks with me is you said, you know, what was even harder than growing up with a father behind bars was coming to realize as a five-year-old girl that the people I love don't matter. That don't matter. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and and to me, that's so powerful because it, it really, I think, is at the heart of the philosophy of Gideon's promise is that as public defenders, we have the ability, we have been given the privilege to have access to a system that destroys so many lives, but our access is in service to communities that don't have access and that public defenders have to be in alliance with communities um, so that we are faithful to the communities we serve. This isn't our fight. We're servants in that fight. And so one of the one of the chapters in your book, and you know, Rap, I'm not going to give away all the chapters because we got (laughs) to sell this book. Right. Three years of sacrifice for everyone. But um, it's giving voice for the voiceless. And I think can you. You talk about communities and, you know, I'm big on you have to build trust with those communities. Um, Voice for the voiceless is a term or phrase that's used often in the nonprofit service space. Can you tell us what does that mean in in, in relationship to criminal justice reform and and more importantly, the work with public defenders? Yeah. So so I think, you know, my guess is most of our listeners are familiar with the work of people like Michelle Alexander and Ava DuVernay and other scholars and experts that, that have really helped us understand that the criminal legal system is simply the latest manifestation mm-hmm. of a 400 year old system designed to control marginalized people, particularly people of color, particularly black and brown people. And That criminal legal system is where the battle, the fiercest battles are being fought today. As public defenders, we have the education, the experience, the training to have access to those systems. And we have the responsibility to speak for people who have been silenced, who have been ignored, who have been deemed expendable, who do not have access to those systems without lawyers who care, without lawyers who see the alliance as critical to the work. And so when I think of giving voice to the voiceless, I think of public defenders who represent 80% of the people in the criminal justice system and the power we have as a movement when we appreciate the need for us to see ourselves as allies, to learn the stories of people who have been silenced, to amplify those stories and to infuse the system with those stories, those narratives, that humanity. Um, That's really the power that public defenders have, to infuse a system with a voice that the system has not wanted to hear for 400 years. And so these, so when when you say public defenders, you know, uh, I'm not a public defender. You are a public defender. (laughs) So why do you say that, Rap? Why do you say that I am, you know, I'm an educator by trade, right? And so... um, why do you say I am a public yeah. defender? You're, you're not a lawyer. Right. That doesn't mean you're not a public defender. Um, what, what, what I think we both agree on and we both say frequently is that for us, being a public defender is about 
a state of mind, a commitment to a mission, a part of a community, doing common work. Um, there are plenty of people who are lawyers who have um, who who have been assigned to stand next to someone in court, but they don't care about the person they're standing next to. Those folks I don't consider public defenders. They don't deserve that title. To me, being a public defender, it, it, it includes lawyers and non-lawyers alike. It includes mitigation specialists and social workers and investigators, support staff, administrative specialists. It's a collection of professionals working together to, to give voice to people marginalized communities, disproportionately black and brown communities that otherwise would not be able to access justice. And so when you say public defenders, you mean everyone who is helping to support people who are accused in the system. And if you have a collective group, right, you talk about collective groups, a collective group that what you just described, that group helps change culture. One of the other themes in your book, in your section, is culture change. I've heard you speak all across the country, and you mention culture change, and we need to, in order to reform the system, we need to change its culture. But I, I'm still not sure that everyone understands what you mean by that, and without giving it all away, mm-hmm. how you do that. Yeah. Yeah, so, so uh, look, I, I didn't really appreciate what culture meant until we moved to Georgia 15 years ago. Um, I spent a decade in Washington, D.C., not really appreciating culture. Uh, But when I moved to Georgia, I started to meet these young, passionate public defenders who would go into criminal justice systems that would beat the passion out of them. These were systems that really expected public defenders to help process huge volumes of cases every day. The expectation was that you wouldn't slow the system down. You wouldn't force judges and prosecutors to think about the human beings behind the cases. You would just help the assembly line move quickly. That was a culture. And what I came to understand was that that culture could shape the best of us into advocates we never would have recognized Mm. as, as idealistic law students. And I think as I started to look at and read different advocates, reform advocates, I saw that there was a lot of focus on funding challenges. There were a lot of focus on on structural challenges, which certainly were problems that needed to be addressed. But underlying all those was a culture. And what I realized was if we didn't change the culture, we couldn't really have meaningful reform. And so I think you and I, I think you saw a similar situation in education. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And, and I think we came together to build an organization that doesn't just train public defenders. It's building a movement to try to transform that culture that is so hostile to justice for marginalized people. So you talked about structure, finance, structure, and culture, the three main components, and collectively they can re- help reform. So uh, as we are looking at the current racial justice movement and criminal justice is, you know, there's a spotlight on criminal justice Mm -hmm. reform. Policy, Mm -hmm. changing policy has been the theme for a lot of reformers and Mm -hmm. and thinking about it. Isn't policy, like, isn't that enough? Like, if we have great policy, we have great legislation, Mm -hmm. wouldn't that be enough? Right. So, look, I, I think policy reform is critical. It's necessary. It's not sufficient. Uh, And when I think of policy, I think of changing the rules that govern the way people act. Um, If you understand culture, you understand that whether we're talking about judges or prosecutors or police or public defenders, that all of us as professionals are shaped by a system. Our values are shaped by that system. And when our values are not aligned with what justice demands, um, we act in ways that subvert justice. Policy fixes can force us to change our behavior, right? We, it can, they can drag us kicking and screaming to act differently. But as long as our values don't change, we will continue to try to find ways to engineer outcomes consistent with our values. So it's important in the short run to change policies, to force people to act in ways that are not so cruel. 
But long-term transformation requires that we transform the values, the mindset of the people who are administering justice. That's culture change. Without that, we will just have a new set of policies that will lead to unjust results. And so that that term transformation is 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 the last theme or section um, in your book and how you, in the basis of the organization, the Gideon's Promise. Can we really transform? I mean, you're at, the, you know, changing values. You're talking about, you know, what Professor ba- the late Professor Babcock uh, said, changing, the, you know, the heart set, the soul set, the mindset. Can that really be done? So... Absolutely, I think it can be. I wouldn't have invested 15 years of my life doing this if I didn't think <laughs> and so. And neither would have I, right? <laughs> right? So you, right? You agree with me, but, but, but it's hard, and it takes patience, and it takes a long-term strategy. There's a, a proverb, until the lion learns to write, the story will always glorify the hunter. Um, and I think that's so powerful because, be, because right now our criminal legal system has been shaped by by a narrative of people who do not have the best interests of marginalized communities Mm -hmm. at heart. And public defenders, I believe, are the key to ensuring that voices that have been silenced are heard. And when we really hear those voices, I believe the vast majority of judges and prosecutors and police are decent people who have been shaped by a culture that's not just. And when when those people learn these stories, when they actually are forced to see the human beings behind the cases as people, people who are as valuable as their own children, their own parents, their own loved ones, that then sparks a mindset shift. It's really hard to treat someone so cruelly and so inhumanely when you understand them as a whole person. Mm -hmm. And so public defenders who lift up the whole person, right, that is a key to a mindset shift that can lead to transformational change. And so, Rap, are there people who may read this book who be resistant to its ideas? Certainly, because I think the other thing about culture that I've come to understand very well is that once you have been shaped by it for long enough, when asked to change, you can become defensive, right? That's true with all of us. All of us can be defensive when we're confronted with the fact that maybe we've contributed to injustice. And so certainly I think there will be people who have been invested in building our current criminal justice system. There will be judges. There will certainly be prosecutors. There will even be some public defenders who will read this book and think it's an attack on them. I want to be very clear. This is not an attack on any individual, Mm -hmm. right? This is an attack on a system that has shaped individuals, individuals who are caring, individuals who are concerned, but it shapes individuals into professionals they don't want to become, and folks who don't approach the book with that mindset might be resistant to understanding its message um, because they may hear it as a personal attack, but it's not a personal attack. It's a systemic attack. So, Rap, you know I read the book. I read it several times. And so it is a a book that centers public defenders in this reform effort. But uh, I often get questions when I go across the country when we were able to travel. Can this model be used in other places? The model that you talk about in the book, the model for reform and changing culture. Absolutely. And as you know, Illy, we've been approached about maybe working with other criminal justice professionals to transform culture. And, and, and I firmly believe that the model we've developed, a model that focuses on what we call values-based recruitment, values-based training, values-based mentorship, values-based leadership, that that model can be used to transform the culture of prosecution, culture of judging, culture of policing. In fact, it's necessary if we truly want transformation. I certainly believe it can apply. Now, I also, as you know, when we are approached, we oftentimes say, sorry, we can't do it, not because we don't believe it applies, but because we are still in the thick of doing the work for public defenders 
and public defenders as being allies and spokespeople for impacted communities, I believe are the most important, the most critical piece of the puzzle. So if resources start pouring in and we can do everything we need to do for public defenders, I think we are perfectly willing to start thinking about how to do this work with other professionals, but our work with public defenders is really still in its infancy. And as the person who is responsible for expansion, growth, and budget, me, <laughs> I absolutely agree. We would love to do this work um, a, a, across the justice system, but our primary focus right now is public defense. So, you know, all yes. the resources, yes, we would absolutely do it. So that's good to know. It's really good to know, Rap, that we can use this across the justice system. And so um, final parting words, right? Um, we know this book is coming out. Tuesday, August 18th, there is a pre-sale campaign going on where proceeds will go to our Gideon's Promise public defenders to bring more in the fold. And just so our listening audience knows, you know, we have a, we've been approached by a number of offices who are um, at risk of their budgets being sliced, you know, because of the current, mm -hmm. you know, the, with, with COVID and all the financial challenges that state and county offices mm -hmm. have. So it's so important for the audience to know that every single dollar we put in is to help support mm. Gideon's promise. And I, I and people always ask, what can we do? We need to bring more confident, caring, and committed public defenders into this program and therefore servicing the, the thousands and tens of thousands of people across this country. So yes. we, we encourage everyone to order the book. Do you have any final parting words before I get to wrap up your show? Yes. <laughs> uh, so the only parting words I would say is, is first to our public defenders. Um, I mean it from the bottom of my heart. We love you. Uh, you all are so important. You're often underappreciated, um, but you really are. In the criminal legal system, in the courtrooms, you are the key to justice. Outside of the courtrooms, your partnership with impacted communities are the key to justice in the criminal legal system. So, so I want to start by just saying we love you and we thank you. To the larger reform community, I think my parting words would be as you think about a systemic prescription to transform justice, don't sleep on public defenders. Don't view public defenders narrowly or small as lawyers who do great work in individual cases. Understand that collectively, public defenders are critical to making sure we hear the voices of, as Brian Stevenson would say, we get proximate to the people behind the cases. Um, so those would be my two parting words. Well, I would like to thank everyone for listening. Rap, this has been a joy interviewing you, being on the other side of the seat. I might end up taking this as my full-time role. I think maybe you should become the host. <laughs> really, you did a great job. You did a great it's job. It's been a lot of fun. Um, we hope you will all join us next month. Um, we have a, This is a monthly podcast. And so in just true form and fashion, I am Ilham Askia. And I am Jonathan Rapping. Wrapping, wrapping it, it up. up. Hey, Il, before we hit that outro, why don't you tell people how to order a copy of the book in your radio voice? In my radio voice? Yeah, in your okay. radio voice. Okay. Get your copy of Gideon's Promise, a public defender movement to transform criminal justice at Amazon, IndieBound, Beacon Press, or wherever books are sold. Pre-order today and a portion of proceeds will help us support public defenders. Oh, that was good. That was good. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Gideon's Promise, the podcast with Jonathan Rapping. For more information on the topics covered and featured guests, please visit our website at gideonspromise.org. And finally, please subscribe, share, and let us know what you think.